So uh, we'll get started. Uh, Sandy, uh, Mark, and Don, if y'all unmute your mics, we'll get started. Did you unmute us? You're mute. Unmute. I'm unmuted. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see all of you, even on a screen. It would be much better if we were in person, but maybe someday. Um, we are blessed with two Bible verses this morning that will be read by Bill. If you have your Bibles, it's Matthew 7, 7, and Hebrews 5, 7. So follow along. <laughs> Sound like a teacher. Yeah, uh -huh. All right, Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And Hebrews... Can what? you hear it okay? 5, 7. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his rever reverent submission. Thank you. Um, congratulations. I hope you read the newsletter Friday. We, we listed all our new officers. Congratulations to all of you that, have, that are new. There were a lot of... Um, the, you know, same people stayed on their committees, which is good, but we have a new president and vice president. Congratulations to Fred Brown and Sandy Martin. And here's my crown that I'm going to hand over to Fred. I know he'll just be so happy to wear this. So, and he'll save it for Sandy. Um, hopefully we'll be able to meet again in our classroom in the near future. It doesn't look Looks bleak at the moment, but we, we shall see. One of the good things about this, however, is our announcement time is down to about nothing. So Sue has mentioned everything you need to know in the newsletter, so be sure and read that. Um, our prayer request this morning, uh, Dick Anthony, Laverne Lamb, Edna Smith, Shirley May, whom I see this morning. It was so good to see you, Sir Shirley. Bill Griffin, Pat and Pat Cooney, Stan and Virginia Thomason. Stan is looking forward to your call, so let's all give him a call. And um, Bill, I think you have something you wish yeah, to Yeah, I just say. wanted to thank everyone for all your emails and your cards and your sweet messages. It's meant a lot, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, this class is just, it's, Everyone knows uh, is just something else. Thanks a lot. I, I concur. Thank y'all very much. It's such a such a blessing to be a part of such a caring group. Um, birthdays. I know I saw him. Steve Covert, July twenty seventh. Frank Foyle, July thirtieth. Peggy McNay, July thirty first. Bill Lanham, I think I saw Bill, August 1st, and Dave Wistrand, August 1st. Happy birthday to all of you. Uh, we didn't have any anniversaries this week. Must have been too hot to get married in July, I'm sure it was. Okay, Don McNew has our prayer this morning, okay. and then our very wonderful favorite, one of our favorites, Mark Goodwin, has our lesson. Don? It is through prayer that we encounter God in a personal, loving, and forgiving way. Prayer is a starting point for giving our thanks for the blessings we have received. Pray with me. God, we, we come to you this morning with an attitude of thankfulness. You have blessed us in so many ways with this nation, this community, this church, and this group of people. And with the love and concern feel for one another. We thank you for the beauty of this day, for the blessing that lets us come together this in Christian fellowship as we worship you. 
thank you for your amazing power and for your presence in our lives, for your goodness, for your grace, and for your love and your care for us. Sometimes we don't take the time to thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do, and for all that you've given us. God, help us to focus our eyes and our hearts on you, for we need you this day. We need you every day. You know our concerns about one another before they're ever spoken. We ask that you give comfort to those in need, healing to those with health concerns, faith to those who may be doubting, and strength to each of us as we continue our walks of faith. We cannot walk alone. Lord, let us feel your presence. We're a troubled world today. The COVID virus has crippled us. We pray for those who are afflicted, for those who are risking their lives in providing aid, for those who have suffered the loss of a loved one, for our scientific communities, for our elected officials, and for those who are living in uncertainty, the uncertainty of the economy, jobs, schools, even peaceful demonstrations. As fear grips our country, let us choose love and let us choose hope. We're fortunate that we live in a time with technology that allows us to stay connected. We do stay connected, but yet many of our members still feel isolated and alone. God, give us eyes to see the needs. Equip your people to offer hope during this time. You have said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. May this be a new era for America, as we acknowledge you alone as our Savior and Lord. We believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, everlasting, amen. Thank you, Don. Okay, Mark? Yes. Are you, here we are, thank you. Hey class, it's good to, good to be with you this morning, but I have to start off by saying I really miss being with you guys. Uh, this just stinks, doesn't it? But uh, anyway, uh, I want to spend a few moments this morning um, dealing with some questions that, I, you know, we don't like to admit it, but we have these questions from time to time. Or if you don't have these questions, I guarantee you, you know someone who does. You know, questions like, why do I sometimes feel distant from God? Or why is there this disconnect? between what I hear I should be feeling about God and what I actually do feel about God. And wouldn't you agree that um, all of us have wondered from time to time, you know, how does God really feel about me? Or does he even like me? Or will he ultimately reject me? Um, Am I really important to him or am I just another one of those anonymous faces in the crowd? Or am I kidding myself to, to actually believe I matter to him? Well, how in the world do we find out these answers to these questions? I think we go to the word of the Lord. And I wanna direct your attention to a passage from the apostle John to start off with that has something to say about this that I just find utterly fascinating. I want you to listen to, first, uh, to, to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, talking about Jesus, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart, and he has revealed God to us. Now, that verse has all kinds of implications, but the one that I love the most is this. 
if I really want to know what God is like, then all I have to do is look at Jesus. Or if I want to know how God really feels about me, then I just need to look at Jesus. Or if I want to know if I matter to God, I need to look at Jesus. For Jesus reveals the character, the feelings, and the priorities of God the Father. I love the observation of a little girl I heard about. Now, her theology was a lot better than her grammar, but she said, Jesus is the best picture God ever had took. And she's right. In this preceding verse, um, verse 17 of this, John says this, the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. You see, when we couldn't make ourselves worthy through our own efforts by keeping the law, and when our strivings came up woefully short, Jesus revealed to us God's gracious personality, and he revealed his outstretched arms to receive us when we deserved it least. Now, here's a question I want you to think about. Does the image of God the Father that you have, does it fit with a God who wants to hug you? Does your theology include that image of God, a God who literally reaches out to embrace you, to hug you? I love that image. You see, God has passionate feelings about us. And I have to confess, I don't understand why he would love the likes of us, but the Bible makes it abundantly clear that he has feelings that are pretty intense. Recently, I was reading the book of Hebrews. Now, if you're familiar with this book, you know that it talks about Jesus being our high priest. Now, that'd be familiar to the Jewish readers who read that back when this was written and, you know, shortly after that. It was a very much, priests were very much a part of their lives. But us Protestants, we don't talk a lot about priests. And so because of that, it's important that we be reminded what a big deal it is for Jesus to be our priest. Now, we've all heard of prophets. You know, prophets are God's messengers to the people. They frequently would, would use the phrase, you know, uh, thus saith the Lord, or this is the word of the Lord. And in other words, prophets spoke on behalf of God. And he, they would bring God's message to the people. Or to put it another way, they were God's representatives to the people. But that wasn't true with priests. In fact, priests seldom gave messages. That simply was not their function. Now, imagine on a Sunday morning that Pastor Tom walks into the sanctuary, and instead of facing the congregation, he turned his back to us, and he just stands there. Well, after a while, I think we'd start looking at each other and saying, well, what's going on with him? What's, what's up with this guy? Who's he mad at? But that is precisely what a priest did in the days of the Old Testament. You see, they weren't there to address the congregation. Rather, they were there to address God. And their job was to represent the people to God and to plead their case to him and ask that God would be merciful and gracious to the people who'd sinned. I like what Tim Keller says about priests. Let me just quote him. He says, his job was not to preach and exhort and lecture. His job was not to speak to the people. His job was to speak for the people. His job was to get into their shoes, feel their pain, bear their burdens, and besiege heaven for them, pray for them, and offer sacrifices for them. That's what a priest is, and that's the end of his quote. I think you know that there were priests, and then there was the high priest. 
And the high priest didn't just represent the people. The high priest represented all the other priests and the whole religious system. And his job was to stand between the people and God and plead for God's mercy. Now, he never talked to God about why these people deserved mercy. In fact, he knew they didn't deserve it. Instead, he would acknowledge that the people were wrong. They'd sinned. They'd messed up. They had violated the commands that God had given them. And he would confess the people's sins and acknowledge that, you know, they don't have any hope outside of your mercy and your forgiveness. Now, I want you to keep this in mind as we go now to the book of Hebrews. I was reading this passage the other day. Now, I've read this passage dozens of times, but it caught my attention in a new and different way. And for the first time, I realized that this passage just explodes with passion. And it's kind of unsettling with the depth of its emotion and um, its, its vulnerability. Listen to this description of Jesus and keep in mind what John told us earlier. Remember what he said? That Jesus reveals to us God the Father and his feelings toward us and his attitude toward us. So listen to this, Hebrews 5, 7. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Now, I have always assumed that this verse meant that when Jesus was facing that horrible, horrible prospect of dying on a cross, that he cried out to God to see if there's any way, any possible way of being rescued from this horrible experience of having to face a cruel death on the cross. And I assumed that Jesus was just being very open, very authentic about these terrible issues surrounding his impending death. But when I read it recently, I saw it totally differently. What if Jesus wasn't praying about his death? Rather, what if he were praying for us? What if he wasn't pleading for himself, but rather he was pleading for us? And what if his tears were not for himself, but for us. Have you ever heard someone plead? I mean, plead with desperation and agony. Plead in a vulnerable manner that just makes everybody around them uncomfortable and kind of ill at ease. Don't miss the amazing truth that's being revealed here. In this moment of intense vulnerability and raw emotion, Jesus is revealing to us the feelings and character of God our Father. Do you see it? God the Father who is revealed in Jesus feels this deeply for you and me. And he's pleading on our behalf. He's crying because of us. He's being radically vulnerable at a level that, frankly, I just don't totally comprehend. So listen to it again. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers. I love that. He heard his prayers. Jesus prayed for you and me. He cried for you and me. And God heard his prayers. Now, I want to be totally true to these scriptures, okay? 
And there is a sense in which this scripture is echoing the scene in Gethsemane where Christ cries out to the, to the Father to uh, have the cup of suffering be removed from him. And then he prays that prayer, not my will, but thine be done. And God answered his prayer <clears throat> by delivering him from death through the resurrection. But I'm also coming to believe that this prayer was primarily a prayer for us. For after all, we are the reason he was about to be killed. We are the reason he was willingly offering himself as our sacrifice. Now that brings up a question that just begs to be answered. What did Jesus pray? Now, if he prayed for us, what did he ask on our behalf? What would he elicit that level of raw emotion and passion? Well, he prayed what every high priest prays for those that he's representing, that the sacrifice that's about to be offered would be accepted by God and that the sins of the people would be forgiven and cleansed and that God would show mercy, that God would uh, not hold the guilt of the people against them and that he wouldn't punish them with death, but instead he would grant them life and a new beginning. Do you understand that in that moment, Jesus is revealing the heart of God and his desire that you and I be spiritually whole, not spiritually crippled, and that we would be cleansed and not be sick with sin's infection and that we would be free, and that we wouldn't be slaves to sin, but free from sin, and that we would be filled with joy and not with guilt. I've come to believe that we view sin much differently than God views it. You see, for us, sin, it, it's a problem, but really, is it so serious that we would uh, plead and shed tears over it? Is it really that big of a deal? It is to God. Understand that sin ultimately separates. It separates us from God. It separates us from each other. It destroys relationships. It, it's not simply having a different perspective or, you know, like you can have your truth and I have my truth. No, it literally is a matter of life and death. It's the whole reason that Jesus came. There's this cliche that uh, I bet you've used it or you have something that has this written on it. You know, know this cliche that we use at Christmas time? Jesus is the reason for the season? Not really. Not really. Sin is the reason for the season. Sin is why he came. Sin is why he suffered and died. And sin is the reason he left heaven and walked on this earth. You see, sin was destroying his creation and it was destroying his people. It had to be dealt with. So he came not to create some cute and cuddly scene in a stable that we could kind of ooh and all over. He came literally to declare war. War on the enemy of our soul war on sin and all of its destructiveness. And here's the question I have to ask myself. Do I take sin that seriously? Do I rationalize it, minimize it, and kind of explain it away? Do I really believe that that is what caused God the Son to plead for me and to shed tears over me? Is that, do I really believe that? Well, we obviously can't explore all the implications of this in the time that we have left, but 
just don't lose sight of how seriously God takes sin. We should take it seriously too. There's another implication of this that I want us to look at. Hebrews 7.25 says this, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him, and he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Now, I find this amazing. Did you know that Jesus is interceding for you this very moment? Now, we think of, you know, about um, us praying to God, but do you realize that this is saying Jesus is praying for us? And because of that, something is happening in my life that uh, I hope will happen in yours. I am finding myself lately praying this, Lord, whatever Jesus is praying for me, that's what I want my prayer to be. Whatever it is that Jesus is asking on my behalf, I want that to become my prayer. Really, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, that's what we're praying. Remember that little phrase that says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In other words, may your prayers be answered in my life. The 19th century uh, philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard once said this. He said, a man prayed. And at first he thought that prayer was talking but it became more and more quiet until in the end, he realized that prayer is listening. You see, prayer is learning to hear what Christ is praying and then making that our prayer. And when you pray that kind of prayer, friend, you can pray with confidence, knowing that we are in harmony with the prayers of Christ, that is life changing. A few months ago, uh, when I taught the class there, I, I shared one of my favorite quotes. I wanna, I wanna repeat it this morning. It went like this. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. As we close this lesson, I, I point you once again to our God who is so passionate about us that he pleads for us and sheds tears on our behalf. Have you come to know Christ this way? Is that the picture you have in your mind when you think of God? Is this image compatible with the image you have of God your Father? I want you to listen to one of the most beautiful invitations you'll ever hear. And it's from this same book, Hebrews chapter four, beginning with verse 14. Listen to this, and would you receive it this morning as a personal invitation from your heavenly Father? Listen to this. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he has faced all of the same testings we do, yet he didn't sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Isn't that a beautiful invitation? May I have the privilege of praying with you this morning? Could you bow your heads and let's pray together? Oh, Father, open our eyes to see you as our priest. Open our ears to hear your prayers for us. 
open our hearts to desire what you desire for us. Open our lives to be willing to pray what you are praying on our behalf. And forgive us for talking when we should have been listening. Forgive us for instructing you when we should be your students. Forgive us for seeking to guide you rather than being guided by you. Thank you for your constant patience with us. Father, clarify our vision. May we see your outstretched arms and run to you. May we allow you to embrace us and heal us and teach us what it means to be your dearly loved children. We pray this in the name of the one who not only prays for us, but who willingly suffered and died for us. In the powerful, redeeming name of Jesus, we come to your outstretched arms. Amen. Thank you, Mark. It was a very comforting lesson. I thank you. When I say my prayers at night and I'm you know, praying to Jesus, I've never actually thought about him praying for me. So that's very, very comforting. Thank you so much. And I know we all have that image of Jesus. Well, we don't, I won't say we all do, but in churches probably worldwide, you know that picture of Jesus that everybody has with his white garment. He's kind of looking Mona Lisa-like, looking kind of heavenward. That's that's how I view him, and um, I know he I know he's hugging Fred Griffin, and has been for the last week. So, that that's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Mark, so much. Uh, our, I guess we're gonna go off into our groups. Uh, yes, if y'all like, we'll uh, break out for ten minutes and then come back, Sandy, and then you can close us. Okay, sounds good. All right, just give me a sec. <clears throat> All right, we're breaking out into rooms now. It takes just a few seconds. <clears throat> 